Hello, my name is James McCullough. I'm from Brigham Young University, Idaho. Uh, my mentor is Dr. Spidka, and the project I worked on was stimulated metal whisker growth. Metal whiskers are hair-like metal structures that erupt outward from a grain or several grains on a metal surface. Uh, they can have many shapes and sizes and are common on cadmium, tin, and lead. They've been known to form on other metals too, though. Metal whiskers are a problem because they can cause short circuits. Uh, they can also break off and cause debris and side circuitry. Uh, in my, uh, through reading some papers, I found some documented cases in which they have shorted out pacemakers, uh, satellites. The military has reported that they've had radar breakdown due to metal whiskers, and the Patriot missiles had some metal whisker problems. And NASA had trouble with metal whiskers on the floor of their supercomputer room. And the samples that we actually worked with this summer came from that floor. Metal whiskers were discovered during World War II uh, when they were growing on the air capacitors inside of radios. This caused the radios to short out. Uh, since their discovery, there have not been any major breakthroughs in the field. It has been noted that lead deters their growth, but does not stop it entirely. Uh, so the purpose of our experiment was to try to stimulate metal whisker growth by creating an electric field in the sample. The way that we did this was by using three particle accelerators. We used the ion beam in this building, uh, a medical accelerator on the medical campus, and the scanning electron microscope. The purpose was that by shooting it with particles, we put a charge on the sample, and that charge creates an electric field in the sample. Uh, another part of my project was determining whether there was a relationship between metal whisker growth and the energy deposited in the sample. So I wrote a code using MCMP, which is a Monte Carlo in particle code. It is a software package for Monte Carlo modeling of radiation transport. I modeled two samples with this code, uh, the medical sample and an ungrounded SEM sample. So the first thing for me to do was to design my samples. Uh, here's the XY plane looking down on the top of the sample, and this is the XZ plane over here. It had a zinc oxide layer with, with steel underneath it and then glass underneath that. Uh, each sample had a different surrounding environment. The scanning electron microscope had vacuum, while the medical sample had air because you can't treat patients in a vacuum. Uh, and outside of the cylinder of environment, there was void. If, if a particle made it that far, then the computer killed it because it doesn't need to track it if it's not going to interact with the sample. So this is the, num the particles that pass through each layer of the sample uh, for the medical sample. Uh, right here is the energy. So 6 MeV was what the beam was on, and we have a spectrum. And then this right here is the density. So 6 MeV is where we see our highest number of particles. The blue is the surface of the zinc oxide at the top, and then the orange is the steel, uh, the gray is the glass, and then the yellow is the bottom of the glass. So not very many made it all the way through. Uh, this stair-like shape comes from backscatter. My code did not take into account the direction of particles through each surface, so those stairs come from particles coming back up through the surface. Uh, for the scanning electron microscope sample, no particles made it past the zinc oxide layer. Uh, to determine how correct this was, I looked up a, a table of stopping powers for zinc oxide and electrons of 10 kilo electron volts and found out that electrons would pass about 0.663 micrometers in zinc oxide at 10 keV. Uh, my zinc oxide layer was 100 micrometers thick, so these results are pretty accurate the particle shouldn't be getting all the way through. And so then I got the energy deposited in each layer. The layers I care about though are the zinc oxide because that's where the whiskers are going to be growing. So I needed to take these numbers and put them in a way that they related to the actual experiment that we carried out. And I did this using the electron fluence for each of the machines, which is the number of electrons per area in time. And I used the total time of the experiment for each, which was 10 hours. And I got these numbers, which tell me how much energy was deposited in each sample. 
Now, the scanning electron beam sample, uh, you'll notice that it is two orders of magnitude higher than the medical sample. What this means is if there's a relationship between energy deposition and whisker growth, then the scanning electron microscope sample should have many, many, many more whiskers than the medical sample. So back to the physical experiment. Uh, before we could irradiate any of the samples, we needed to count the whiskers on each sample. Uh, the way we did that was we used the scanning electron microscope. It could be done with a normal microscope, but normal microscopes have difficulty illuminating whiskers uh, with their point source lights. This is what we would see. Uh, with, a side, with light coming in from the side, you might be able to illuminate a whisker, but in order to avoid that problem, it's just easier to use the scanning electron microscope. Then each, each sample had 40 pictures taken, and then I counted the whiskers in each sample, and from that I calculated a whisker density. And after they were irradiated, they would come back to us, and we would do the same process again, giving us a before whisker density and an after whisker density. So our very first sample was the grounded SEM sample. Originally, we did not intend to have a grounded SEM sample, but after irradiating our sample for 10 hours, we realized it was grounded. Uh, and so we got some extra data that we didn't intend to. Um, it was so it was irradiated for a total of 10 hours at 10 keV. So we decided to do another sample that was ungrounded. And the way we fixed the problem was we got a piece of glass and put it underneath the sample. Glass, of course, is an insulator. So it allowed the particles that we were shooting up at our sample to remain on the sample. So the sample would be charged and we get the electric field, which is what we wanted. Uh, so that happened for a total of 10 hours at 10 keV. The next sample is the medical sample. It had glass underneath it as well, but not for insulation purposes. The medical beam operates at a much higher energy. So we wanted to catch particles that were going through the sample, and glass is able to do that. So the glass would then get a charge on it, and that charge would create an electric field in our sample. Uh, the medical sample was irradiated for 10 hours at 6 MeV. It was sent to us, we counted the whiskers, and then it was sent back and irradi irradiated for another 10 hours. This was the only sample that got irradiated for two sessions. Uh, the ion beam in this building, was, it was tin that was used as the material. Uh, originally the sample was a little large, so we cut it to be a quarter of its size. Uh, we put glass underneath it to insulate it, and it was then bombarded with tin at 130 keV for one hour. And then the control sample stayed in a box like this for the entire summer. At the beginning of the summer, we counted the whiskers, and it was the very last sample to have its whiskers counted. So here are the results for the control sample and the grounded scanning electron microscope sample. Uh, these peaks down here, we have uh, density, so the whiskers per millimeter squared, and frequency here. And these are the density this is the mean density right here. So as you can see, this is initial and after 10 hours, the peak did shift for both the control and the grounded. Now we expected the control to grow some whiskers because whiskers grow naturally all the time and cause problems. Uh, it was interesting to see that the grounded sample grew the same amount as the control, but almost the same. So that tells us that simply bombarding our sample with electrons isn't enough to cause excess whiskers to grow. Uh, you need to actually keep the charge on there because without it there's no electric field. Uh, this one over here is the 10 beam sample. Uh, this is initial and this is after one hour. So the density actually decreased by over 60%. Now the reason we believe that this happened is the 10 reacted with the zinc oxide which caused corrosion. Now the whiskers are actually made of zinc oxide, so if you're cor corroding the zinc oxide, then you're corroding whiskers as well. This is the ungrounded SEM sample, which saw over 50% increase in whisker density. So that's more than the control, so we are actually growing whiskers. And here is the medical sample, which has quite a big change. After nearly 20, after 20 hours, it grew over 90%. And after 
10 hours, it was about 38%. So back to the energy deposition uh, compared to whisker growth, we expected the ungrounded SEM to have uh, many more whiskers than the medical sample after 10 hours, but if you look at the actual difference in densities, they're not that far off. So that means that whisker growth is not determined by energy deposition, but rather the charge on the surface, and that charge needs to be continuous. And whiskers that are left alone will continue to grow. Those are the big conclusions that we made in our experiment. I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Shvidka, for helping me work through all of this. Uh, and everyone that worked on the Metal Whiskers project, there was a lot of people, Dr. Karpov, uh, Rick, Depeche, uh, the grad student I work with, uh, Greg and Corey. I'd like to thank the NSF for making this program possible, and Linda for everything that she does for us. Are there any questions? Yes. So I just want to. Uh, so I, maybe I, I just want to see if my conclusions are correct about what you said. So basically, you said that uh, charge causes growth of new whiskers or nucleation of new whiskers, but growth doesn't. Growth will happen even without charge. Is that yeah. Right? yeah. So you can see in the control sample, we didn't do anything with that, and it grew whiskers by itself. But when we had constant charge on the sample, uh, it grew more whiskers than what it normally would have grown just leaving them alone. Now, did the existing whis whispers, whiskers grow more with that with due to the charge, or are they just there were just more new ones created? So I actually did. I looked at a few whisker heights uh, with, on the medical sample. And uh, from what I gathered, the whisker heights did not really change as we irradiated them. What we got was just more whiskers per area rather than making the existing whiskers taller. Yes? Um, how much does, if, if this were lead, how much whiskers would grow? And, you know, they, they made you change the solder because, you know, lead is toxic. Yeah. So uh, is this just the rose compliant thing? that we're having this problem now? I, I read, it, the papers I read, they didn't have any exact numbers on how lead decreases the amount of whiskers, but it, it, it's a substantial difference. And by changing the soldering, we will be seeing a lot more whisker-related problems. So, so how much does this limit the life of things? You know, because lead solder used to be okay when, you know, we'd lead paint, lead in gasoline. Yeah. Then you're worried uh, about the kids eating it, so, but now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, every system is different, yeah. so I'm not really sure how much time we have. Dr. Karpov, who is kind of the guy in charge of metal whiskers on this campus, thinks that metal whiskers are <laughs> the next Y2K bug. They're going to just destroy yeah. everything. Yeah, I mean, because yeah, it's like, remember seeing like old pieces of tin, you know, there's always something coming out of it, but lead that never happens. Yeah, well, it, it does happen, just not as frequently. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, this might have been asked last time, but so you're bombarding it either with electrons or, or tin. Yeah. Right? Um, and you're either bombarding the actual sample or in the case of the medical one, the glass, right? So, so the medical one, the, it had the sample with the glass underneath. Oh, and okay. as you saw from my MCMP code, mm -hmm. the, the, the zinc oxide actually did absorb quite a bit of those. But the glass helps create a, an electric field in the sample. Okay. So, so is there any evidence? I mean, can do, do these damage the, you know, or and even the measurement, you know, using the SEM itself, is there any damage that's done through this bombarding process of the whiskers? Uh, so we actually we uh, we zoomed in really closely on a piece of a whisker, and we bombarded it for several minutes with really high voltage and high amperage uh, electrons, mm -hmm. and uh, the whisker was totally fine. So we didn't mm -hmm. notice any change in the whiskers themselves. Didn't you also see whisker growing? Yeah, uh, one, even when it was uh, grounded, when we were counting whiskers, we actually witnessed a whisker grow. It happened, it, the, the, the way the SEM works is it's, a, a, it's updated by frames, and it, it wasn't a gradual growth, it was a sudden growth. We, it happened between frames. Yes. So, so if we want to solve this whisker problem, we want to find ways to stop them from forming and growing. 
And if charge is one way to, that one thing that causes them to, to form, then presumably grounding things very well might stop them from forming. Is that correct? That's uh, what I think. Or uh, you know, another way is bombarding them with tin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We chose tin because it was in the bean at that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Trying to so get the the electric field causes the growth and not the <laughs> charge. Well, the charge causes the electric field. Yeah, that's, so that's what we're yeah. going for. So say you have a tin and you have no charge at all, like you don't do any charge. Over the years it's going to grow um, whiskers because what happens is metal will have like a bunch of poly So in, if it's a perfectly crystal, like in the EM class, there's no perpendicular E field going up. But in real life, what happens is there's a bunch of grains to it. So there's like a charge different, um, difference in charge. So you have dipole coming out. You're saying the charge differences across grain boundaries? Across the two grains, say if you have two grains, one might have like three electron and other might have two. So there's a dipole coming out. That's what causes the, or according to, to the carbon theory, Dr. Carbon's theory, that's what is happening. Yeah. <laughs> so bombarding <laughs> electron to increase the average uh, dipole. Sure. Oh, okay. yeah. So the work function of the metal is not important, or is it? Probably not. <laughs> I, I don't know. And the, the whiskers are, are an oxide, right? At least. Yeah, we, we use the EDS to look at their composition and their zinc oxide. 50% mm -hmm. zinc. So you could put these things in a non-oxygen environment, mm -hmm. right? If you don't supply it with oxygen, do you? The uh, we're not sure about that. Be because all of our samples were had oxide on it, well, that would be we need whiskers that were. In the yeah, bare metal surface usually does, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly, aluminum quickly oxidizes the surface, and I assume mm -hmm. it's truly tuned to it. Yeah. Yeah. How hard was it to set up the MCMP program? Uh, Dr. Schmidt could help me out a lot yeah, with that. Yes. That was it was interesting. It's a card-based program, yeah. so that Both was brands. yeah, that was different. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> it was card-based in the program itself. That's what they call every entry card. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. Let's thank James.